So uh, we acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered is part of the traditional Chippewa, Potawatomi, Odawa, and Delaware nations. Uh, and it is the sacred responsibility of all people on this land to ensure that the environment remains protected. Uh, a few housekeeping items. Please make sure your microphones are muted. Uh, and Natalie will take uh, questions after the presentation. So please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen uh, to type in your questions if you have questions. And please note that the session is being recorded. Uh, we do post this on our YouTube channel. So if you know someone that couldn't make it or you can't stay for this and you wanna look at it again, it, it's certainly available there. Uh, so I'll just take a moment and introduce our speaker. Uh, so everyone, and her bio was also posted and I think sent to everyone. So uh, Natalie Merchant, of course, is our speaker today. And Natalie is passionate advocate for the sustainability and environment, environmental stewardship. Uh, she believes healthy uh, environments are essential to healthy communities. Natalie has a master's degree in environment and sustainability from Western University. Uh, and a degree in biology specializing in conservation and biodiversity. She works at uh, Green Economy London and folks on helping local businesses to reduce their environmental impact. Natalie helps them to measure their carbon footprint, set reduction targets and create action plans to achieve those reductions. She's also uh, brings together a network of business leaders that are taking uh, sustainability initiatives and celebrating uh, their successes. So I'll uh, turn it over to Natalie and uh, she can take it from there. Amazing, thank you for that um, introduction. I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. Um, let me just get my presentation up for you. So hold on one second. Can we see that? Good, okay, great. So today I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about um, reducing emissions. Um, a lot of my work focuses on the business aspect of that, but I also wanted to look at personal emissions and it's more relevant now than ever with a lot of people working from home as well. So it kind of fits in with my work as well. Um, so who am I? Um, I just had a great introduction. So I think we kind of covered that, but um, I am the hub manager at Green Economy London. It is a program that is run through the London Environmental Network. Um, I also have some background in energy auditor training. So um, I'm a certified energy auditor and I look at commercial buildings and um, the energy processes in those buildings, as well as I have my lead green associate. So there are some green building background I have. Um, so what does the London Environmental Network do? Um, it's an, an we're an environmental nonprofit organization um, in London that aims to cultivate a more sustainable, healthier city. Um, our vision is to have London be known as one of the greenest, most resilient cities in Canada. If any of you have been to London, you know that is not true right now, but we are aiming for that. That is our goal, as I'm sure um, you guys in Sarnia are as well. I'm assuming most of you are from that area. Um, and our mission is to build uh, participation, collaboration, and capacity in our community to co-create positive environmental change. So we currently run six programs um, that are under the environmental network and I um, run the Green Economy London um, program. So that one is focusing on supporting businesses um, and organizations in setting and achieving sustainability targets. Um, but we do uh, host a bunch of other programs that look at connecting um, other environmental groups together, supporting them. Um, we do a green drinks when COVID <laughs> was not a thing and we would get together monthly um, to uh, socialize and to recognize any type of sustainability initiative going on in the city for that month. Um, we also normally co-host a um, Go Wild, Grow Wild Expo, which kind of looks at the natural environment, but we had to cancel that in 2020. It did move to an online platform. so. Um, there's now an online uh, website that you can look at that focuses on um, green in your home and that kind of stuff. It's called My Wild Green Home. So if that's something you're interested in, um, I would 
uh, recommend checking that out. You can just type in my wild green home and you should be able to find that. Um, so these are just some of the organizations that are in London that are part of our network. Um, and there's over maybe 45 environmental groups that are part of that. So part of what we do is connecting those groups together to bridge the gaps that um, any of those groups need so that they're connected together so no one's overlapping all the things and everyone can get that information um, from the groups and we connect volunteers and people to those groups. Um, whereas my program I focus on is the Green Economy London program and um, essentially it is a network of hubs across Canada. Right now there's seven in Ontario and there um, one just opened in Edmonton and one of them is launching in New Brunswick um, and it is part of an overall or an overarching group called Green Economy Canada. So that is a national nonprofit that um, essentially all of these hubs run similar programs with the aim to get businesses to start measuring their um, utilities and, and their impact and essentially setting sustainability goals. So we're looking at like carbon, water, waste, um, stewardship, that kind of thing. Um, right now we have over 44 businesses in London participating. We launched this program in 2019, uh, May of 2019. So we're just over a year um, in operation and we've had to pivot a bit with COVID um, where we are doing a lot of um, virtual programming for these businesses and support. Um, but it has seemed to be going well. We've been continuing to sign up new businesses. So there was definitely an appetite in London for businesses to have some type of external sustainability um, support that they might not necessarily be able to have with their capacity um, at work. So we're essentially like a remote sustainability office for those businesses. So we look to help them set targets. So we focus on their GHG emissions. So um, looking at measuring their building emissions, primarily the scope one and scope two. So their heating and electricity um, footprint, but we also do look at scope three emissions. It's kind of more of the um, commuting, kind of more of the extra emissions that aren't necessarily through like building operations, which has been a very interesting one this year with COVID and the shift for moving from working from the office, commuting every day to working from home. So essentially all these employees are not commuting anymore. That's a significant decrease in their GHG emissions um, for scope three. So we've had actually a bunch of businesses interested in retro actively measuring what their commuting footprint was uh, two years ago to what it was over the past year to see that reduction in, oh, is this something that we should be doing more of going forward when COVID is not as pressing anymore and people can work in the office? Should we have people more uh, working remotely if that's going to help with that scope three emission reduction? So it's something that businesses are taking note of. And it's one thing that's been interesting to note throughout the pandemic and working from home, just those shifting of where those GHGs are coming from. Um, we also look at environmental stewardship. So that's looking at the um, impacts in your community and the environment and more of the natural um, ecosystems. So we try to get businesses to participate and support projects in the city, whether that be tree planting or looking at um, supporting a beehive uh, sponsorship or um, pollinator gardens and stuff like that. So that's kind of more for businesses that don't necessarily have control over their building operations. They may be renting a spot in a building um, where they can't really control those bigger HVAC um, projects or do really any changes structurally to their building. So we give them an option to participate in this program through that. Um, we also look at waste. So we're looking at reducing waste um, primarily, but also diverting waste. So if um, they need they're making sure that they have an organic stream and recycling and things like that. Um, and then we also look at water conservation, um, which is great for not only reducing their water usage, but also that helps with reducing their uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. When you reduce water, you're reducing the amount of water that's being treated through your city water treatment. That's a lot of um, chemicals and GHG emissions in the energy processing of that. But also um, I found with a bunch of our members who are community, uh, centers or gyms uh, who have showers and lots of um, people using their bathrooms and stuff like that, the hot water you use, um, if you switch out with low flow fixtures, it really does make a difference in the heating of water. And so you're 
your, your gas bill basically goes down as well when you are um, using less hot water. So that is just another area of the water that also fits in with GHG. So um, just another, one more last slide on our programming, which is um, our uh, employee engagement section of our program. So we run a monthly or a yearly month long employee engagement campaign, which is to try to get employees um, engaged in the sustainability plans and goals of an organization. Sometimes um, these sustainability goals are made by like the top top down kind of thing. And to really have them work, you really need everybody on, on board. You need all the stakeholders. So include all, all of your um, employees need to participate with um, building occupancy. You need to have people um, going along with the energy efficient measures that are being put into your building or else if people are using too much energy, it's really you can make a building as efficient as possible. But if people are still wasting energy and um, so on, it's not it's going to be as effective as it would be if people were um, educated and um, part of the process of implementing these things. So that's kind of what we try to stress with the employee engagement month. Um, we do have a guide on it. It's the workplace green up. And um, if that's something you were interested in looking at, you can check that out on our website. It essentially gives you activities for a whole month um, of how to um, look at reduce your GHGs for a week, reduce your water, reduce waste, and then stewardship projects you could do. So that's just a little bit of a background so you know what I do on the daily at work and that is what our program focuses on. Sorry, my dog is, <laughs> he has been a little bad. So if you hear some chewing, he is currently on the, on a tangent. All right, so um, what I wanna look at today is kind of revolving around carbon footprints. And as I'm sure all of you are in agreement with me, Climate change is a very serious, um, prominent issue that we um, need to address and um, cause climate change in a variety of ways, primarily through burning fossil fuels um, to heat our buildings, transport people and goods. Um, greenhouse gas emissions are also released through garbage decomposing in landfills, refrigerant gases leaking from old appliances, large scale ag agricultural systems and chemical processes. Um, People also contribute to climate change um, through our clearing of forests, so deforestation and other areas that absorb carbon dioxide. Um, so <laughs> uh, all these greenhouse gases essentially um, form a heat trapping blanket around the earth. Um, while this produces warming on a global scale, we mostly experience it as an increase in an extreme weather. Um, so with climate change comes bigger storms, longer droughts, more fossil more forests, fires, and so on. Um, there are natural factors such as the sun, the earth's orbit, um, volcanic activity, but um, that also impact climate. However, scientists have concluded that the degree and rate of warming um, we are experiencing today is primarily the result of human activity. Um, so reversing climate change means keeping GHGs from going up into the atmosphere and we want to draw them back down um, into carbon sinks like forests. Um, so there's no shortage of solutions to climate change. There are things from electric vehicles to renewable energy to something as simple as composting food scraps. All of those help. Um, the good news is that a lot of the climate friendly solutions are also good for our health. So that's great. Just for an example, biking um, rather than driving whenever you can. That, um, for example, people who bike tend to uh, enjoy their commute more. They feel stronger, healthier. Um, it does save money as well. It also helps keep your city's air cleaner. Um, so it's a win-win solution there. Um, you probably do a lot of things for the environment already. Um, and we're going to kind of go through a lot of those today. Um, we're also going to be measuring our own carbon impact. So I'm going to be going through a live carbon calculator with you guys today. And um, you guys are all welcome to join me and open up a separate page on your computer if you wish or do it on the phone or just watch, watch along with me and do it later on your own. Um, but it is a great tool to kind of realize our own impact and what we can do um, to reduce our impact and kind of make a difference. So just to go uh, give you some science behind that, um, what we're talking about here on, with the emissions. Um, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, um, predicted that we only have 10 years to prevent catastrophic global warming, um, which is going to require a 45% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. 
Um, so also households contribute 45% of Canada's emissions um, and that category includes housing emissions. So your natural gas, your electricity, um, as well as your personal vehicles. So all your gas vehicles. Um, here in London, I have a London's example here for you on the side. Um, you can see on the graph on the right that personal vehicles contribute the most to GHGs um, in the city, more than housing, commercial buildings, freight transport, local industries, and so on. Um, so most people don't really realize that this is a result. Um, we underestimate the huge impact that we ourselves have on our everyday choices and overall on climate change. So I just wanted to also highlight this is um, Canada's overall GHG is broken down by sector. So you can see again, transportation, industry, buildings, electricity, agriculture, waste. They all have significant impacts. And then within all of these, we ourselves contribute to transportation, um, our places at work, buildings, residential takes up most of that. Um, electricity, residential is a huge part in electricity, agriculture, so the food we eat and so on. So that kind of just gives you a little visual of how it's broken down throughout Canada. And I'm going to go through a little bit of a localized case study. Well, for me anyways, it is um, looking at London. But so London's population is about 400,000. Um, and so, so the amount of cars we have in London is about 286,000. Um, home and water heating. So there are 175,000 private houses, private dwellings, um, as well as for waste, there's about $600 a year spent in wasted food per household in London. So it's a significant number. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you some of the GHG emissions and the targets that were set for London. Um, so we have um, London basically has set three targets. So by 2020, they wanted to reduce 15% of their 1990 levels. And then by 2030, they want to reduce 37%. And then by 2050, they want to reduce 80% of their emissions. Now I know they already met their 15% reduction goal um, for 2020. I believe it was close to 20% um, reduction by then. Um, so they did exceed that one, but there is, some blips on the chart there. So there are circumstances that will change the normal amount of emissions being held. So you can see in 2008, when the stock market crashed, there were less emissions, people were doing less things. Um, and that was just kind of less um, economy, some, some stuff like that. And then you can see also the blip at the end there in red from 2018. So extra cold or extra hot summers or extra cold winters, really hot summers can affect the amount of energy we're using to heat and cool our houses and buildings. So that can have a significant impact on the energy we're using per that year. So you can see that's kind of why there was a, a weird blip at the end there. But overall, they have been reducing emissions um, and they do have a new net zero goal of net zero for 2050. Um, but a lot of this is due to Ontario's electricity grid getting cleaner. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with um, Ontario's electricity generation, but I'm going to go through a little bit about where our, gener uh, our electricity comes from and why it's a lot cleaner than it used to be. So um, essentially, we did close all of the coal power plants in Ontario, which made the entire electrical grid cleaner. Um, Ontario is actually one of the cleanest grids in the world, if you believe that, um, as long as you're okay with nuclear energy, which is another topic on its own, and we're not really going to get into um, nuclear energy, but nuclear energy is considered a clean energy in terms of GHG emissions. Um, so a kind of interesting point I wanted to make about that is also, so for smog alerts, I don't know if um, you guys have ever um, had one in the past, but so a single smog alert was for Southern Ontario, um, was the only one in the entire province for that year, and it only lasted about two hours, and that was in 2019. Um, there have been no uh, smog advisories since 2012 in London, um, but back in 22 or 2002, we had 60 smog alert days that year. Um, the coal plants were mostly phased out by 2010, um, or their production was reduced, and then by 2014, they were all shut down. Um, so at their peak, when all were operating, the provincial's coal plants accounted for about 25% of the province's electricity. Um, so now that those have phased out, we're noticing obviously less smog, um, so cleaner air and um, by far much cleaner grid in terms of GHG emissions. 
um, although our emissions are set to increase through electricity productions um, since Ford government came into place as they canceled a bunch of extensive green energy projects like windmills and electrical. Um, and there will be more natural gas going into the grid. So we will see the impact that has on the energy grid being less cleaner. But for now, electricity is actually a very clean energy source compared to natural gas. So if you do see some people are switching to um, electric heaters, electric um, they're trying to electrify their homes or buildings because it is coming from a cleaner source than natural gas. That is why you see a lot of push for electrification right now. Um, so this is just kind of, again, going, looking at London's business emissions. Um, I just want to highlight like the top three emitters were um, construction, accommodation and food services, as well as retail, um, which isn't that exciting. Um, I just kind of wanted to highlight here the breakdown of emissions by activity. So again, for the businesses, um, building energy is usually number one in their emissions. And then transportation is number two. Um, and then again, waste. And then electricity is a, a, just a small slice there because of our electricity grid. Is, that's why we want, so that building energy, it's such a huge sector there. We want to make more of that energy um, coming from electricity rather than natural gas to reduce that quadrant. If that makes sense. And again, this is just was just looking at um, Ontario's energy from electricity. So if you were curious to see that breakdown of what ele Ontario's electricity was, um, about 90% of the electricity in Ontario is produced from zero carbon emitting sources. So we have 60% um, from nuclear, 22 or 26 from hydro, 7% uh, from wind and 5% from solar and then the small other category is from uh, biomass, geothermal and petroleum. So small chunk there, but as you can see, we do rely a lot on nuclear for our clean energy, um, but uh, yes. All right, so how can we best mitigate those kind of emissions? Um, well, the fastest, most effective way to reduce our impact is to divest from fossil fuels. Um, so essentially for our heating, we want to go move away from natural gas, which is almost the standard for most buildings across Ontario. Um, so we wanna look at switching to renewable sources such as geothermal, solar or air source heat pumps. Um, we want to reduce emissions from travel because that's also a big category as well. What can we do for that? We can consider biking and walking as probably the cleanest. Uh, options. That's not always a possibility in Ontario. We know it gets cold here. We know we need some type of enclosed um, transportation. So switching into an electric vehicle can also reduce the GHG emissions from your car, which is a big one, um, or taking public transport. Um, having our cities switch to electric fleets can be also um, a great way to reduce public transport emissions as well. Um, walking and carpooling is also, of course, um, an option if it makes sense. Um, as well as we wanna reduce energy usage to begin with. Um, what I always look for when I'm recommending um, a, an action plan for a business to reduce their emissions is first reduce what you can before we even look at the renewable options. We wanna just cut down what we can, like what are, where are we wasting energy? Um, are people have lights on when they shouldn't be? Is there certain um, equipment running when it doesn't need to be? Um, so just things like that. Can we set the temperature on your thermostat back a couple degrees when people leave the office? Can we program that to, to change every night? You know what I mean? So something like that, something as simple as that, putting occupants, occupancy sensors into rooms where people aren't necessarily using all the time. So the lights and whatever's in there can be turned off and then go back on when they are being occupied. Um, same with dimmers. If you don't need all that light in an office that you have a lot of natural light. So either turning off lights more or just reducing the amount of lighting sometimes also. Um, of course, using energy efficient um, uh, appliances and light fixtures. Light is a huge one. Um, LED lighting is probably one of the most, um, it's like a 90% reduction in energy use from what old light bulbs used to be. So it definitely is one of the easiest switches you can make to reduce your um, electricity consumption um, is switching to LEDs if you haven't done that already um, in your business or home. Um, you can also consider the reduction in methane from properly disposing organic waste. So when you, when you throw out your organic waste into the 
the garbage and it gets sent to the landfill essentially that will produce methane and it will be released as if you as as um sorry my dog <laughs> stop it um it, as opposed to if you had a composting system i don't know if you guys have a green bin program in sarnia area but we don't have one in london yet it's supposed to be starting in a couple of years but so we're stuck with um, composting in our backyard which is great even better um, less emissions from the collecting truck but um, yeah we try to do what we can to um, compose decompose those organic wastes in a in a better way than sending it to the landfill um, as well as what i touched on earlier about conserving water with low flow, low flow fixtures and then water catchment strategies um some other ways we can look to seek cleaner investments or consider switching banking services so do you know if your bank is investing a lot in fossil fuels um, you can make a point by um, switching banks to one that doesn't have necessarily a huge fossil fuel portfolio within their investments um, you can report on and budget your emissions and expect the same of others so that's more business related but you can also take account for what your own emissions are at home um, change the conversation and make sustainability the new business as usual. Um, are you having these kind of conversations with your family and your friends, your coworkers, something like that? Um, teaching your kids about it. Um, are you, you can also offset your impact by engaging with local tree planting or conservation groups um, or certified carbon offset purchases. Um, a common one is um, bullfrog energy. A lot of people, a lot of businesses have been using it to offset electricity and natural gas usage at businesses, but you can also do that at your home as well. Um, there's a other environmental friendly considerations. So cleaning products, something like that, um, reducing your plastic and single use items, and then looking at um, your food choices and where you're sourcing them from and uh, those kind of things. So why do we want to measure your footprint? Why is it important? Um, well, first, you can't manage what you can't, which you don't measure. Um, you want to know where you're starting off, so you kind of have a starting point to see where you fall. Um, and you want to keep track of how you're doing. Are you reducing? Um, are you making improvements? And then you do want to celebrate the successes. I find with businesses, it's really um, encouraging when they're trying to make all these changes. They're seeing their reduction in their um, environmental footprint. They're seeing that um, they're re they're reducing their emissions and then we like to celebrate that and it does kind of encourage them to keep going um, and the same with our personal lives I think that it just translates perfectly so um, most of our daily choices come from behaviors that we're hardly aware of um, they're habits that we've developed gradually over time and we don't really think much about them um, consider a time you wanted to change something important um, maybe it was your doctor wanting you to improve your health by managing your blood pressure um, or your financial advisor suggesting to reduce your debt load um, for greater security in leaner times. Um, having a clear measurement of your current blood pressure or debt load is probably the first step you want, right? Um, so you want to measure your footprint to help you understand where it's coming from, what areas are contributing to that footprint, which is essentially what I'm gonna get to. So like looking at does a long distance flight your trip to Florida, does that have a bigger impact than your year round heating of your home? Um, where can you reduce in your own personal life to make a difference if that's what you're trying to do? Um, so we're gonna, gonna run through a carbon calculator in a second um, to kind of give you a tool to like, look at what you, where you're currently um, have it and i just put a picture of a fitbit on there i don't know if any of you guys have any step trackers or of an apple watch or something like that but i know for me ever since i got mine i am walking more i'm exercising more as i am keeping track and tracking it so that's kind of another thing to just solidify why it's um can be really beneficial to um track this kind of stuff to look at it to measure it and to um just talk about it so essentially what I want to do next is go through this calculator. So sometimes uh, it can be really overwhelming to try to measure your footprint on your own. Looking at the emission sources, emission sources is difficult um, because emission factors vary a lot depending on your region, um, the electric grid where you're from, or what's if you're a city dweller or rural um, in a rural area. So we this tool is really great because it factors all that for you. It hides all of the the uh, complex modeling um, and you don't have to actually go through any of that it's pretty simple um, there's a simplistic test we'll go through first and then 
um, I encourage you guys on your own time to go through and um, do the kind of next steps of it. So um, you can put in your energy bills. So if you have an online account from your natural gas provider and your hydro, I would recommend going to those accounts and adding those numbers in there for like your monthly usage. Um, you can do that. Um, we're not going to do that part of the calculator today, but that will give you a more clear image of like the footprint. And it usually will, your footprint will lower if you do the specifics because it is generalized through the, the like the simple um, quicker one that we're just going to go through right now. But then when you take the further steps, it's like continue. Um, I'll show you how to do that, but it is um, right there. So I'm going to open up this page. So if you guys want to follow along and do it yourselves, you're going to want to go to www.projectneutral.org. It's right there on the screen there. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to open up a new page here for you guys. Um, Right. Here we are. So you're going to see something like this on your page. Um, and we are going to want to get started. Oh, I have uh, my old one. I'm going to register for a new one to go through the process with you. So here we go. I'm just going to My name in here. Ask for your email just in case you get locked out of your um, account. You can request a password, but um, if you don't, let's make a any password. All right. So you should see a page like this. Welcome to Project Neutral. Um, they're going to ask us a couple of questions to get a snapshot of our carbon footprint. And remember, I'm just doing the, the generalized one. And then um, I'm going to talk about like the other steps you can take afterwards. So where do you live? I'm assuming most of you are going to be around Sarnia, so you'll probably want to put in elsewhere in Ontario, and then it's just going to ask you the name of your city and your postal code. Um, I'm going to put London in because that's where I am right now. Um, it gives me a specific neighborhood. I think it'll just ask you for your, your postal code if you put in um, um, elsewhere in Ontario. Um, and I live near... Hmm. Single. All right, so getting started. That's just going to generalize. It's going to help to um, specify your footprint, just the area where you live, and that's essentially where it is. So I, I live by myself, so there's just one. Um, I have no children in my home, so um, zero. <laughs> and we are going to, I live in an apartment and how many bedrooms does it have? Um, if you click home, it might ask for how many levels of your house there is. Um, there's, it might have some different um, options. So let me just check. So just, yeah, just make sure you, you fill that out um, according to what is your, um, where you're living. Um, I rent my apartment and how old is it? It is, I'm gonna estimate about 60 years. I don't know, but it should be in there somewhere. Um, transportation, this is how you get around um, and it include any of the above, like if you just bike once a week, that still counts. So I, I bike, walk and public transit. I don't own a car right now, so I'm not driving. Um, did anyone, I did not fly. That has actually helped my carbon footprint. I, my family lives in um, Thunder Bay, so usually I fly to Thunder Bay twice a year. Um, and I haven't done that in over a year now, so that has significantly reduced my carbon footprint from when I have done this calculator previously because air travel is probably one of the biggest GHG emitters for me in my life. Um, so it's kind of been nice to at least um, say I have had a cleaner footprint because of that. 
Um, I do have a plant-based life, so I am vegan. Um, how much do I, I, I do it more than I would like to admit. So sometimes <laughs> that is one of my, one of the things I want to work on is making sure I eat all my vegetables before they go bad because I do not have a compost. I am in an apartment building. Um, it, I do not have one, um, but I would love to have one. Um, waste, so this is kind of gonna look at your waste. They're generalizing here. So if you throw out one big black garbage bag, then you would put about four uh, grocery size bags. So I, I have a garbage system in my apartment, so I'm just gonna put that in there. Um, grocery sized bags, I'd say about one, almost one a week. Uh, so I'd put one, if you put like out a garbage bag, it's gonna be more for that there's more people living in your house, but that's just how they measured it. So four grocery size bags would equal one black bag. Um, does my house recycle? Yes, we do, or yes, I do. <laughs> and um, this is just kind of gonna ask if, um, because I'm on the London page, you probably won't get this, this won't pop up for you, but, um, uh sure you can share my they're just collecting data in london there are certain areas that are have um co they're collaborating with the city um in those municipalities to collect that data to um kind of measure the footprint of the city but i don't know if i don't think they have a specific one for sarnia right now um yeah sure okay and then it will take you there. So this is just gonna, how would you find out about us? Well, we are currently at a, an event, I guess you could call it. Um, I'll just put that and then I, I don't think I need to fill it out. Let's see. Now it's gonna calculate. So this is a simplified um, version of the footprint which is just kind of give you based on where you, what type of home you live in, where you live, your, just a general overview of your transportation, eating habits, garbage, I'll put stuff like that. So right now I've got a carbon score, score of 4.3. So I am below average, which is good. Um, but it says the top 30% is 3.2. So I'm not the best <laughs> for where I live, but it's still okay. Um, there's definitely things I can do. Um, and this calculator will kind of show you the areas where you are like most impacted in. Um, so for me, um, home emissions and food emissions are the two biggest uh, ones. So if you wanted to go through more detail of your carbon footprint, you would go through these. So I finished one of six surveys. So you're going to want to get into um, the home energy survey and then the daily transportation. So everything we just went through, it's just going to go through in a little bit more detail with you. It's like, it's a couple like one, a couple minutes per category. It's not like anything extensive, but if you did do the home energy one, they might look at your bills. It does say, give you an option, like not to do them. Um, let me, I'll just click on that one to just show you. Um, so this is just kind of going to get into a little bit more detail about your home characteristics. So like, how is your home heated? Um, I don't really know. I think my, we have a boiler system in my apartment. So I'll just quickly go through this one. So I'll just say forced air furnace. Um, what type of furnace? It's definitely natural gas. Most people's will be, unless you have an electric or um, some like on propane or something like that. Um, or if you're on like some type of renewable, that would be really cool. Um, how is your water heated? That's a traditional hot water tank. Um, what type of water heater do you have? Most people will have natural gas heaters, but electric are are not uncommon. Um, do I have air conditioning? I do have um, a window in the summer. So just kind of questions like that. They're just gonna help to specify like where your emissions are coming from. So this is where you could put in your um, energy bills. So I'm not gonna put mine in right now, but if you wanted to get your bills from a year, you can do that. If you like have an online portal for your bills, um, some people might on, be on paper and it might be harder to collect them. But if you do have like them on your online account, it's really easy to go in there and just get that data and put it in. Um, but right now we're just gonna skip that um, for now because I'm not gonna put them in, but you just basically put in your, um, you select the provider and then um, put in the bills if you wanted to do that. And then this is kind of gonna give you some ideas or it'll, you can list things that you're already doing. So I have LED light bulbs in my apartment. Um, I have a low flow shower head. I do close my blinds. Um, I can't lower the temperature. I, I don't have that capacity in my apartment, but that it could be something that you were doing. Um, weatherproofing and insulating windows. Um, I do not have that. I don't do well. 
the apartment does that, I suppose, but um, I don't have a smart thermostat because I don't have the thing, but if you have a smart thermostat, so something that um, is usually programmable is considered a smart thermostat or the ones that are like digitalized and look like a, basically like a circle or like a iPhone almost kind of looking thing. Um, improving the foundation. So that's kind of out of my control. Um, I don't know if I have a high energy. I do have energy star rated appliances. Um, I don't know. And then you could just put this is kind of just to journal your own kind of things just to keep track. And so I'm not gonna put anything in there. But then you just go to calculate my results. And it's kind of going to give you a footprint in that category. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and I really like this tool as a conversation starter for businesses to get employees engaged. It's a, it's a fun kind of workshop we'll do for like an hour with employees to get them to fill it out and they compare their scores and talk about it together. But it's also great to do in schools um, to get um, children to start kind of thinking about this kind of thing, um, as well as um, even just like your friends and family. Uh, it's an interesting conversation starter to start looking at um, your, your carbon calculator. I know there are a bunch of calculators out there but this one is to me uh my favorite one um it's kind of more comprehensive more localized to ontario so it's kind of um more relevant and there are some great action tools in it which is the part i like um so you're like action journal and you can kind of it's easier to select actions that you're doing and also give you ideas of the ones you're not doing um, so my carbon score was 5.8 again i'm above average but uh below the top 30 percent <laughs> so i got work to do um in the in terms of that and it will go through here so like if i wanted to look at the take action category for home energy emissions so i'm going to look at here and then this is the these are the kind of actions we kind of went through like what ha aren't i doing or in the future if i purchase a home what do i want to be able to do what am i going to take this action these are kind of just commitments you're making to yourself um and it kind of gives you an impact so if you pledge to replace your storage tank water heater with a tankless water heater, it has a higher impact than if you were to um, do something like use a high efficiency furnace. So it, it does have more of a high ranking, but it does show you here the difficulty. So it might be more expensive, more time consuming project, but it does kind of give you a, just a little bit of a, an idea of those kind of projects um, right there. So yeah, that is just, I wanted to just go through that calculator with you guys. There's, and so then, before I, I stop the calculator, I will just say you can keep going through all these. So you can keep going through daily transportation, travel, food waste to give you a more comprehensive footprint. I highly encourage you to do all of the surveys and going through and making um, action plans for them. It is kind of fun and it is a great way to um, just kind of keep yourself accountable. Also to kind of discuss um, what you're doing with your household and stuff like that. Um, so this is the page you kind of want to look at what you're doing, what are you pledging, fun things to share on social media as well, or on Facebook or something like that. Um, as well, there's also a uh, community aspect. So um, groups can join a group. So if you're, or you can create a group. So um, that is a, a function that's going to be coming soon, I believe. Um, I uh, have worked, collaborated with um, one of the um, the directors of this program uh, of this uh, nonprofit, and he, um, they're I think launching the group aspect of this type of um, calculator in the fall, I believe. So um, essentially, if you have an organization, so say your group wanted to compare your your um, carbon emissions together, um, you could create a group, and it will kind of show different footprints and then the actions everyone's taking. So it's kind of a nice thing to uh, for a business for an organization to just have the whole team just kind of committing to certain actions to um, something like that. So if that makes sense. So I'm going to stop sharing this and go back to um, I think I think we can address some questions now. And I do have some uh, question prompts in case we don't we have extra time or something. But um, I do have a couple questions I'll go through quick just to give you some ideas to think about. Um, hold on. How do I get back? Stop sharing that and then I will. Um, share screen here and portion of the screen. All right, so um, these are just kind of prompt questions. I'm quickly just gonna get you to think about, and I'm gonna look at what we have in the chat for questions first. But um, 
uh, one thing to think about it, if you've done this with me or if you're going to do it later, are you surprised by your carbon footprint? Um, think about the areas that um, had the highest impact and maybe reflect on why that is and what are the actions you could do to reduce that. Um, similarly, how are you going to reduce it? Um, are there structural barriers uh, preventing you from reducing and like what are they? Um, a lot of the times people who want to implement solar on their roofs are, don't have the capacity from their local um, hydro not being able to connect to the grid. That is a very common issue in London anyways, um, where the transformers don't have the capacity to connect to solar, which is really annoying. Um, and it's like a provincial issue that needs to be addressed. So some, something like that is a, a structural barrier out of your control um, that is preventing you from doing something. Um, uh, what do you think needs to happen for businesses and organizations to reduce their emissions locally? So that's just another thought provoking question. I kind of went over a few things, but um, what can you as an individual do to influence that? So again, some of the things we talked about, but also some of the things that pop up in that calculator. Um, what's the most important thing for your city to do to help climate change? So this is obviously, um, it's a general question, but also specific to your, your municipality and what you guys prioritize and what you think is more important in your city. Um, and then how can your organization play a role in the rest of climate change? And I think you guys are having that conversation and you're trying to make that conversation um, more common among your um, community, which is amazing. And then what are your next steps? So that's kind of something to think about. So let me just pull up the... Um, uh, Natalie, I can just ask them to you if you want. Oh, perfect. Yep, okay. that works. All right. So... Uh... For one of the questions is, how does your organization differ from the LEED certification? Yep, um, LEED is essentially for only for green buildings. So it basically scores your building depending on what projects and what measures you've implemented into a building to make it energy efficient and overall sustainable. We kind of look at the whole holistic picture of what your business is doing. So not just the performance of your building, but also um, the actions you take in your community, um, your overall footprint. We kind of look at the actual emissions. Lee doesn't really look at your yearly emissions after that. They kind of build a building to make it efficient, but then don't really necessarily focus on like your re reduction every year. And we are kind of trying to get those businesses to reduce over a 10 year period for their target to go from, um, 80 tons a year of emissions to five tons a year. So they want to do it like a 90% reduction. So what projects do they need to include? We kind of go through the whole process with them. So it's it's, it's different, but um, they both essentially are trying to promote um, sustainable buildings and um, using those buildings in a sustainable way, I guess. But we, we focus more on the whole aspect, not just the building aspect, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Uh, it says, we have read about the problem of development threatening habitat in London like uh, Meadow Lily Woods, is London Environmental Network taking on the developers? And if so, what is the strategy? That is a great point. Um, we do have some advocacy that we do, um, and we do have a partner or a relationship with the city, I should say, where we um, focus on um, when the city comes out with budgets, we do, um, talk about that we host events for people in the community to have more accessibility to go and comment on those types of things. Now our network doesn't necessarily um, do the advocacy ourselves, but we connect the groups that do. So there are environmental groups in London that would address more of those specifically, but our organizations Focus is more to get those organizations connected to be able to amplify. We want to amplify their message. We don't necessarily um, go and do that work ourselves. Um, we just don't have the capacity at our, our, our nonprofit, but we definitely support the nonprofits that do, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Uh, it says, is London considering electric buses? I believe so. We, I think our first, their first project they're planning on doing, and it's been in the works for a few years, is a rapid bus transportation system. So essentially they are creating a, a road, like a, a lane for buses. So I think that is the first step. And then they do have that down the line. I don't know when that will happen, but I would love to see it sooner. Um, I know there was an announcement with one city that is going completely electric. And I can't remember if it was Hamilton or, or something like that, but we aren't electric yet. We, um, it is something that they are considering. I know that 
for a fact, but their rapid transit is what they are focusing on, which is debatable for some people. Okay. Uh, it says, what is your opinion to use nuclear energy to reduce uh, greenhouse gases? It's, <laughs> I'm not an expert on nuclear and I don't have all of the answers on the, the pollution side of it, but in terms of nuclear over coal, I say yes. Um, I would prefer to see less natural gas coming into our system. I know they are phasing out one of the, one of the nuclear plants, so there will be more um, natural gas being added to our grid. So it's going to be a little bit more dirty. It's going to have more GHG emissions, but um, I think we just need to focus on those cleaner. What can we get the more renewable? Like I want to see more water, wind, um, solar projects being able to be put in before nuclear. But if nuclear is the only option, I would rather have that than um, coal, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question here is, how are you funded? How is your organization funded? We are funded um, through mostly grants. Um, our, our, um, we do get a bit of money from the municip uh, our municipal government, provincial government, or I don't know if we have any provincial government grants right now, but the federal government. And um, we do have local um, organizations that fund us. We did just become a registered charity last week. So um, that will be something that will help fund us through um, donations. And we do have sponsors. So um, I, our Green Economy London program, our businesses do uh, join with a membership fee. Um, so that is the only program that does take a fee um, to run that program. And, uh, but essentially we do mostly get through uh, funding and through donations is how we source our, our fund. Okay, uh, this is a, a question from the tool. It says, did anyone score in the top 30%? I don't know if you heard me or not, or. That's it, going towards everyone participating. Whoever filled out the calculator, did anyone get in the top 30%? That's a, and it's a great uh, conversation to have um, within your group later on too, when everyone does have the chance to go through it. It would be a nice discussion thread to start um, sharing your footprints with people. And again, that community group part of that calculator will be launching live soon. So it, it is um, uh, something to, circle back on if uh, that's something you're interested, I can send you the details when that goes live, but. Okay, uh, it says, if a city doesn't have a citywide composting, are there composters that work for say condo buildings or large businesses? Um, there are options for large businesses in certain cities, like a lot, of, I know in London we do, um, we don't have residential uh, green bin program, but we do have some of our, our waste collectors will um, collect compost. We this is terrible, but London has two of the largest organic composting facilities in Canada. Like it processes basically all of Toronto's green bin, but us in London don't have access from the city to put it there. Uh, so that is frustrating, but it, it's supposed to, we're supposed to get one in 2023. That is in the, that is in their, their plan. But um, I am just learning that there are, there are options for if you're in a condo, if you're, if you um, don't necessarily have a backyard, um, you can, have there are composts you can um, put on a balcony or outside um, they can get a little bit messy um, there are vermi composting units that you can get which essentially uses worms to compost them um, and they're not that big um, again you'd have to upkeep them and uh, if you have a car that would be good to help transport that fertilizer basically that's going to be made every year out of it to put into someone's yard or into a forest somewhere but there are options it's more work um, but uh, it, if there's a if there's a will, there's a way for those kind of things for sure. Okay. It says, does your tool look at home and yard activities and how much stuff you consume? Example: highly manicured lawns, leaf blowers, pools, frequent alterations. Those are excellent, um, excellent points. Um, those are all very high consuming, um, either energy or. Um, chemically. I don't think that the calculator does look at that kind of stuff. Um, but it, yeah, I don't think right now it has the, the, like the emissions from those types of activities or the impact they have. Um, but they definitely have an impact. So that's a great point to make um, whoever brought that up because um, that's something that I do look at with businesses is their, what they're doing for landscaping is a big thing. When are they watering um, their, uh, their 
their like lawns and stuff like that and what are they using and how can they improve that um, is the landscaping company they use um, using gas powered equipment um, so there are some or do you use gas powered equipment at your house there are electric options now so that is something to think about but i don't think that calculator will um, and capture all of those details um, so it's not highly inclusive again you could add your like extra extra actions you're doing into those types of things but i don't think it's going to include that i don't believe uh, it says have you factored increased carbon use due to covid more disposable plastics meal deliveries for example Yes, and that's a topic I've been having with a lot of restaurants that have been um, joining um, Green Economy London, so my program that I run, and uh, that's a lot of what they have been talking about. Some of them never even did take out before COVID, and obviously um, to keep their business running, they needed to switch to um, disposables because uh, they're no longer using plates before. They never really had to worry about that waste outcome, and it's not necessarily their waste, but it's now on us it's our waste um, there are programs that you can do um, to help reduce that type of waste um, they there's a company called a friendlier company and they are starting a um, reusable container program so essentially there are a bunch of businesses that sign up for this program so they offer these plastic containers so it is a plastic reusable container but you return it when you're done using it and it will get washed and then we'll go through the system and another restaurant will serve that to someone else and essentially it works on a believe a deposit so you you would take out your container you return it you get a dollar back um so it's kind of incentivizes you to return the container so it's like a, it's a loop system so your that container is going to be used a hundred times and the footprint of that is much better than all of the single use even if it's compostable they aren't really compostable they don't really decompose in those like compostable tego containers um, so single use plastic, there's a, definitely a trade off from COVID is the high impact of single use and a lot of it was for safety reasons and understandably, but also look at all the masks. How many masks and gloves do you see when you walk down the street? I know my dog tries to eat so many of them when I'm on a walk and it's really frustrating, but the, the flip side of COVID has been the decrease in emissions from transportation. Think of all the like the flights that have been um, decreased as well as even just personal emissions from cars it has there's like a there's an equilibrium there somewhere but the overall global emissions have decreased I don't know the exact percent um, but I know there was a study done um, a few months ago that looked at um, an estimate of how much they would have reduced um, it was significant um, and of course some of that was from factories being shut down too so it's not always great but it was an outcome okay it says uh, Libro has shown was shown on your list they announced they no longer have fossil fuel investments and are, B, are a B Corporation certified. Did you help them attain the certification? They actually had gotten their certification during the year that we were talking to them. So that you know, we did not help with that, but we will be measuring their footprint yearly now going on. So that to maintain a B Corp, you need to report your emissions yearly. So that's now what they've hired us to do. So a lot of businesses, McCabe Promotional, they're a advertising company in London. They also were looking to get B Corp certified. We helped them get B Corp certified and we are gonna to continue to help measure their footprint and report on that. So that is part of our what our business offers is to help them get to that. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the um, the nurse, the plant nursery humans. Um, they are a big strawberry and plant greenhouse in right outside of London and they just installed a major solar panel installation. We did help with that, um, helping them find a contractor and getting um, some funding to support that project. Um, so that's one of my favorite projects that's been done this year um, because they did a big um, social media campaign to kind of share their environmental sustainability and Hemans is a really popular business in London. So that was a kind of a great story that I really enjoyed. So I don't know if anyone um, saw that or have been there, but it, they're, um, really committed to sustainability and it's great to see local organizations sharing their story because sometimes these businesses are doing great things but they're not necessarily don't know how to share that story so that's part of what we do too is helping people share their their sustainability successes to inspire other people to do them too great it says with more of a focus on preventing climate change are jobs in the environmental sector in high demand right now Absolutely. Um, I just had a, a meeting today. Actually, we are going to be presenting um, a green jobs fair um, in June, I believe. 
um, with uh, different aspects in the environmental sector, but um, for corporations alone, so big corporations, almost every corporation now has a sustainability office or a person in charge of sustainability reporting on what the footprint of that organization is. Um, it is definitely something that has been booming in the past few years. I know when I was in the middle of university, um, it became a really hot topic and um, I kind of shifted my, my uh, conservation side to more the environmental sustainability side to work with organizations because I thought it might have more impact um, in working directly with companies instead of just the research aspect, which I love as well, but um, it's definitely being pushed and um, which is great. But I wish it, there wasn't a need to do all of this stuff. I wish we were already just doing it, but um, it's definitely a very hot market for jobs and there the job market is increasing significantly in the environmental sector for um, people wanting um, jobs in that sector, if that makes sense. Great. Uh, it says, what would you say has been uh, uh, the biggest success story to date and what can we learn from that experience? Um, in terms of maybe in, your, the, your, your environmental network. Um, that's a good question. There are definitely a few feel good stories. Um, we, we do our own, uh, grant program every year. So we have, uh, community donors, um, fund us with certain amount of funding and we are able to support projects, um, from that funding. So, uh, Last year we were able to support 14 projects and that included just like things like LED lighting, switching low flow fixtures, um, stuff like that. So I think my point there is almost all of these organizations want to do something. Um, and it's, I've been really inspired talking to all of these business um, leaders in London and what their goals are with sustainability. And a big issue with small and medium sized businesses is like cost. This stuff is expensive and there's not that much incentivizing from um, the provincial government right now. So it's hard to implement a lot of these projects. Um, but when an organization is able to, or if we can help them get funding, like when we helped Hemans get some funding to support their um, solar project, that was like, felt great for me to be able to support them in that way as well, because I know people want to do this stuff. It's just sometimes hard. It's, it's a lot of extra man hours. It's it's expensive, but when it's able to get completed, any project to me is a win. Um, whether it's small, just switching your lighting, like to me, anything anything you do is a step in the right direction. So I'd say like every project we were able to support has been a win for me. Um, and I just connecting with local businesses and really hearing their story and like their vision for like how they want to green their business. And it's it, it does make you feel a little better because when you think of a lot of companies and businesses, you, like you don't necessarily connect it with the sustainability part and you just think they're doing it just as a greenwashing thing or something. But no, most of these people do it as a core part of like their beliefs. Um, it's just helping them find those um, projects to do or what, what, what they can work with their budget, something like that. So I would say uh, just the inspiring, it's just inspiring working with people and have them wanting to do this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm hoping that there'll be more support from um, the government um, soon with the announcement of the federal budget. Um, there is a lot of money going towards a lot of um, greening projects. So there might be more opportunities for businesses to get those kind of um, projects implemented at their business with the help of um, the government, which would be great. Okay, that's great. I want to thank you for your uh, presentation. You certainly have given us lots of things to think about. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, our next speaker will be the 26th of May. It's Climate Smart Yards. Carolinian uh, Canada Coalition will be presenting that. And then the 23rd of June is the effects of climate change on the Great Lakes. So hopefully we'll see people there and once again, uh, thank you, Natalie, that was great. And that uh, carbon calculator will be well used, I'm sure. Great, so, thank you for uh, having me, guys. You're thank welcome. You.